I love seagrass for many different reasons. They are the most beautiful and intricate ecosystems. So in the seagrass mode, you're gonna find all the juvenile fish and all of the juvenile crabs and these beautiful, beautiful megafauna like turtles and manatees. And then they all sort of travel from the seagrass to the reef. So it's really kind of this chain reaction of life. Seagrasses are marine flowering plants. This means that they're more like terrestrial plants than they are algae. So they have roots, they have true leaves, and they have tiny flowers that if you pay attention and go there at the right time of year, you will be able to see. Seagrasses operate as what we call nurseries in which the juveniles of commercially important species grow till they get a certain size and then they start their free living outside of the seagrass beds. Another thing that they do is they prevent soil erosion because they pack in sediment, and this actually keeps us safe during storms and they help protect our coastlines. In the U.S. Virgin Islands, we have native Caribbean seagrass species here. So we have Thalassia, which is known as turtle grass. We have Halidouli, and then we have Syringodium. And then we also have Halophilus stipulaceae. Halophilus stipulaceae is native to the Red Sea, Persian Gulf, and Indian Oceans. In 2002, it was first reported here in the Caribbean and Grenada. And ever since then, it's kind of migrated west and north. And finally, it was reported here in St. Thomas in 2012. Halophilus stipulacea has at least the potential to change the types of animals that associate with seagrasses. We know that the fish communities in seagrass meadows comprised of halophila are different than the groups of fishes that you find in native seagrasses. It becomes an invasive species if you can start detecting negative effects on native communities. And that's where we are with halophila stipulacea. Since Halophila stipulaceae arrived in St. Thomas, research has shown that it does displace or take over native seagrass beds. So if you ever do go swimming in, say, Brewer's Bay here on St. Thomas, that seagrass that you're seeing is all invasive. My lab is pretty versatile because our overarching topic is how animals and plants interact with one another. My student, Matthew Sousa, is interested in the fisheries aspect of this. And he's particularly interested in how this newcomer seagrass is affecting conch populations. My name's Matthew Sousa. I came down to St. Thomas to start my master's degree in the Marine and Environmental Science program at the University of the Virgin Islands. The first experiment that I did was a feeding experiment called a choice experiment, which means that the animal was given only one option of any of the seagrasses and two algae that are common in seagrass habitats here in the Caribbean. And this is to look at how much the animal will eat of each type, or if there's any avoidance of certain seagrass or algae. I'm doing a tethering experiment in conjunction with the feeding experiment because it's looking at a predator-prey relationship and looking at how the Halophila stipulaceae, the invasive, is showing any difference in predation than the native species. So the importance of the small invertebrates in the seagrass beds is because they're the foundation of the environment. Without them, the bigger fish that we rely on will not have food. And without them, we'll disrupt the entire ecosystem from the bottom up. Once we have done more research, and you know, that might take years, um, then we can start thinking of, okay, well, this is causing a problem. Now we need to think of management solutions. How can we manage this invasive species in a way that's not gonna lead to any more impacts on the environment? I'm excited to find these answers because it will let us better understand the ecosystem but also it leads to more questions. In most good science, you get more questions than answers. We know a lot more about the small questions because they're easier to tackle than the big questions. And that, but that's where we're moving, trying to see whether we can study it 
at different scales, seeing how fast it's spreading and what is causing the, that spread. If we're gonna be managing this, we need to know about the big scale things. Next time you're in the water, just take a moment, breathe, and really take in everything that's around you because you're gonna see and you're gonna hear things in the water that you didn't think of before. And so taking that back and, and relaying that message of these ecosystems are just as important as coral reefs, they're just as important as mangroves, and they should be treated as such.